goes over for gosses, they don't survive on it. You know, if it flies, it dies is, is, a, is a little phrase that's been used quite frequently in this context. And I'm afraid it's absolutely true. Hello, my name is Sasha Dench, but I'm better known as the human swan. I'm also the UN's ambassador for the Convention on Migratory Species. This year, the charity I founded, Conservation Without Borders, is launching a new expedition to follow the flight of the osprey, an epic migration of 10,000 kilometers through 14 countries from Europe to West Africa. As a part of this, we're doing a series of podcasts to highlight the global stories and connections this bird makes, to help us see our complex and challenged world through the eyes of this incredible animal. In this episode, I speak to Steve Watson about a bird of prey that has caused us some grief in the past few weeks in taking out a couple of young ospreys that we've been following closely. But also there's been grief on social media amongst those disappointed that some of us would feel emotions at all about wild ospreys dying or in fact that the bird responsible is threatened itself and does not need the negative PR. We're talking about the goshawk, an expert predator. It has been vilified for decades as evil and a bird that kills for fun in the world of some gamekeepers. Steve introduces us to this undoubtedly impressive bird and whether it is a thug or threatened or both. Um, okay, so Steve, thank you very much for joining us for a chat about goshawks. I don't know if you've heard, but we've been following the migration of the ospreys this year. And on that journey, we've had one of the ospreys from Pool Harbour, the juvenile ospreys this year, was taken out by a goshawk. Basically, it was pushed off the nest. It was um, picked up by the staff there but it didn't recover and then we have just been following the incredible journey of a bird called Tweed uh, from the Tweed Valley who seemed to be having a fabulous time either short stopping maybe it would have maybe it would have stayed sorry either staging it maybe it would have stayed in Portugal and uh, we yeah it was also lost uh, to a to a goshawk in Portugal um, and so yeah there's been a lot of talk of uh, goshawks um, and so we wanted to bring you on as somebody who knows a thing or two about goshawks and uh, tell us a bit more about them and also potentially explain why uh, quite a few people have said how can a goshawk take down an osprey size by size it doesn't look like the osprey would be prey yeah okay well first thing is uh, the goshawk is as you say has a smaller footprint um, than the osprey, um, but in fact, it, it's an absolute thug. Um, you know, I have to say that it is. Um, Helen MacDonald compared it to a sparrowhawk, and she said, if the, sp if the sparrowhawk is a pussycat, then the goshawk is a tiger. And I think there you have it in a nutshell. Um, they're incredibly powerful. They've got massive talons, uh, and, and, and this is their methodology of striking. Um, so they will take anything that's available in the environment to them. So if it, if it happens to be a goss, uh, if it happens to be an osprey that is somewhat bigger, as you say, they would have no compunction in taking it to feed their chicks. Uh, but I think we should um, remember that they're adapted to do this and they will, they will take um, squirrels. Uh, in fact, 50% of their prey in the forest of Dean is squirrels. Now that's quite a well-armed mammal. You know, and you wouldn't imagine that a, um, a 1400 gram goshawk could take a squirrel, which is well armed, but it can. And therefore, of course, it can take other large prey like pheasants, uh, corvids, crows. Uh, so, so it is well adapted to do it. But we must also remember that this bird was extirpated in the UK in the 19th century. And, and there were no goshawks here as well as no ospreys probably for similar reasons they were poisoned they were trapped and they were shot and it was only in the 1930s that it started coming back through falconer releases into the new forest and other releases in other forestry areas and they've such they've started to grow the population to reasonable levels and the osprey was being taken out for reasons, including the fact that they would take fish from, from fish farms. Was there a particular reason the goshawk was targeted to extinction? Yeah, well, they take game birds, um, in particular pheasants, 
Um, and of course, this would have put them into conflict with gamekeepers. Um, and so that would have been, you know, a reason. But there was a time back in the 19th century where anything um, with a hooked beak and talons was targeted by gamekeepers, whatever it could or could not do. Uh, now, it has to be said, a, a goshawk is, is, is one of those birds that will take larger birds and they're voracious. Uh, they are, as I said, thugs, um, at, you know, and they're very well adapted to take almost anything in the environment, even, even items bigger than them, such as, unfortunately, the case in point, uh, the osprey. Uh, unusual, it has to be said, it's very, very unusual this is a case, and of course it's very sad. Uh, but, you know, if you're a goshawk and you're feeding a family, then all you see is food. Um, and fortunately, it doesn't happen that frequently. And you would say unusual, but I guess it's also unusual in the grand scheme of things that there are so few ospreys or there have been so few ospreys. Well, I, so, yeah, I suppose yeah. that is true. Unusual in the sense that there are not very many goshawks around in the UK. There are not that many ospreys around. So the opportunity for confrontation confrontation yeah. is limited between those two species for that reason mm. um but it, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a target prey that they particularly go for um above above their normal prey range which as i said before you know is is corvids squirrels wood pigeons that sort of thing mm -hmm. um so steve can you take us back to uh, a moment that ignited your fascination with the goshawk I absolutely can. Um, and I'm, I'm actually a peregrine man myself, as I've told you before here. Um, I've been studying them for 40 years at Simmons Yacht. Um, but in around about 2005, we started noticing goshawks in the, in the Simmons Yacht territory of the peregrines. And, and these were just odd observations. And we thought, oh, that's interesting. And then it became more frequent. And then they started nesting um, in the territory of the peregrines. So clearly one was taking a closer look. And then there was a moment, which you indicate, there was a moment when I saw a male peregrine, which is gonna be around about 700 grams, attack quite, quite, quite hard, a female goshawk in the air. Now the female goshawk is well armed, is twice as heavy, but actually in the air, the peregrine just hammered it until it was knocked down into the forestry. Um, because the 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 peregrine's domain is the air. The goshawk's domain is forestry um, and, you know, un 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 under the uh, canopy. So therefore the peregrine is, so I, I, I noticed that and at that point I thought, oh, okay, I love peregrines, but I really need to understand goshawks as well. And was the, was the peregrine attacking the goshawk as potential prey or attacking it because it was near a nest site? Yeah, very good question, Sasha. Uh, yeah, not as prey. Um, this was where, at a time when the peregrine had fledglings that had just fledged. They would therefore be vulnerable to a goshawk and it was attacking them as a territory defence mechanism. Um, and so what is the status of the goshawk currently in the UK? OK, if you go on the BTO website, you'll see it's between 500 and 600 pairs. If you go back to 1933, there were zero pairs in the UK. So these are falconers releases largely that have, uh, ev have gradually increased the population in various of the strongholds that there are, which is mostly forest land. I think there was a in 1933, there was a goshawk noted in the new forest in 1979 or thereabouts. There were jesses and bells seen on a bird uh, over forestry in the Forest of Dean. And since then, the population has, has, has increased dramatically because all they're doing is reclaiming their ecological niche. Do you have any idea of what a, I guess, the, the amount of forest and forest cover and land use has changed over time? But you, do you have a feel for what would be an acceptable number of a healthy population of goshawks in this country? Ooh, that's okay. a difficult one. I can tell you, though, that forestry in the UK, because uh, I've just I've just written a book with uh, Richard Sale on peregrines and we've covered land area use. Um, in the UK, land area subject to forestry has increased quite dramatically, which is perhaps not something you would imagine, is it? Uh, but it is the case that it's gone from about 5% in the UK to about 10%, if I remember rightly. Don't quote me on those figures. 
But clearly there are a lot of um, conifer plantations that have been developed over the recent period, the last 40 or 50 years, particularly in Scotland, uh, in Wales. Uh, Forest of Dean has a large forestry area for conifers, but also uh, broadleaves as well. So um, I, at the moment, we have a density maximum of about one goshawk per square kilometre. Okay. So I'm just trying to give you a feel for that. I think in the Forest of Dean, uh, we've got 3,150 square kilometres of land in the Forest of Dean. Sorry, in, in Gloucestershire as a whole. Of that, a small percentage is the Forest of Dean. That's at saturation point now, and there's about 100 pairs. More or less at saturation point, there's 100 pairs. So I think probably, you know, several thousand pairs would be about where you might expect it to end up. Uh, but as I say, um, I'd need notice of that question. I'd need to do some work on it to be able to tell you more, a better figure. But that's my gut feel based on this conversation. Okay. Um, and can you give us an idea of the sorts of threats that still exist for the Gossack? Is there still significant persecution in different parts of the country? Absolutely, Sasha. Sasha, there certainly is. Uh, Drilling grouse moors, I've got to say, you know, it's political, but I've got to say, no go zone for gosses that don't survive on them. You know, if it flies, it dies is, is, a, is a little phrase that's been used quite frequently in this context. And I'm afraid it's absolutely true. And I don't see any major change in that. So there's that big issue, driven grouse moors. Um, but also there are pheasant interests in uh, patches in, in our local area. And of course, you know, they would be concerned about gosses taking their chicks. Uh, and so, therefore, there is some persecution in our area based on that. Uh, when they co come into conflict with financial and gamekeeping interests, then there's a problem. Some landowners are very, uh, are very good about it and they will allow it uh, and they will accept it for what it is and, and take it, if you like, as an occupational hazard. Others are more militant and aggressive and will take their own action. And, um, you know, and that's just the way it is. But generally speaking, the goth, goth hawk is doing really well in the UK. Uh, the population is increasing. As I say, it's reclaiming its, its ecological niche. Uh, and, and, you know, in Gloucestershire, they're doing really well. Have you got any examples of where you feel like attitude uh, on, on a site, um, attitudes have been changed positively? Yes, towards absolutely. Absolutely, I have. There is a local estate large land estate um and i won't mention the name um but this has recently passed hands into the next generation if you like and this next generation uh, their main concern in all of this land area is to rewild it and therefore they have been working with us and other uh, raptor conservation groups um to get an understanding of you know how raptors use that environment and they are absolutely positively against raptor persecution. And I see this happen. I've seen this happening in, in a couple of estates in Gloucestershire. I can't imagine it's not ha happening elsewhere. And this, I think, is a generational thing. There seems to be a turnaround in attitudes, and, you know, in the younger generation in particular, where rewilding is, is something that people really want to do who have got access to these big tracts of land. So I'm really encouraged by that, I have to say. And do you think that sort of interest is coming from those who've got a background in conservation as well as those who've got a background in, well, in particular, shooting? Um, do you know what? I, it's a difficult question, that, and I don't have any particular instances, but I do get the feeling in local conversations that the shooting community are, are becoming much more amenable to this question of wildlife conservation and raptor conservation and are taking a, a somewhat different attitude, particularly, again, I'll make that point, in the younger generations. Um, I think they're embracing a sort of holistic view of nature as a whole, rather more than used to be the case. Um, well, I hope that's the case. I feel that's the case. Uh, but, you know, if I was to take a sort of view as to how I feel about this issue generally, I'm, I'm mildly positive about it. Mildly, cautiously positive. Oh, well, that's a cautiously that's a good... is probably a better word, Sasha. 
um yeah that's uh that is interesting to hear i mean we we've spoken to uh groups in spain who are dealing still with quite serious levels of uh poisoning for example of of birds of prey and all sorts of other things but the sort of reports they're creating give numbers in the tens of thousands and um they have been great at saying look they are they're doing their best to try and tackle it uh, and uh, they realize it's potentially slightly worse in Spain, but it has happened elsewhere. They've also pointed out that um, in other places, potentially also in the UK, it happened uh, at a much higher level and earlier. So we've already done a lot of the sort of killing. So the background numbers of birds we've got are so low compared to what they have. Yes. Um, and so we've constantly had to eat humble pie in um, in speaking to people and uh, yeah, yes. realize that. So whilst we might feel that we're kind of at the at the forefront and doing really well in conservation, actually in the past we have um we have um yeah given our wildlife a really hard time. I think that's right, and and you know you can make the parallel about the at the Amazon rainforest, can't you? Because we've cut down a lot of forestry in the past, and and we can then say, well, you shouldn't cut down the Amazon, but actually we've already done that. Yeah, you know, to a much smaller extent, but. It, it gives you it you lose credibility when you come from an area where this has already happened but it happened centuries ago do you, yeah. do you see what i'm saying absolutely as i think that's what i'm finding it's it's repeatedly important that we acknowledge that before we start having a conversation and say Look at, to be yeah. to be realistic absolutely absolutely sasha can i just say one last thing um, but Richard Sale and I have just completed writing a monograph on peregrine falcons which is going to be in, on sale in November. Uh, we're thrilled with it. Uh, we think it's a very interesting book. We like it. It should interest conservationists. So can I just put that plug in there that that book will be available on sale in mid-November. Can you then give me a few reasons of why we should be so interested in the peregrine? Well, the peregrine is an iconic species, um, which most people in cities will now see because it has over the last 20 or 30 years become a highly urban bird and it's changed its range substantially. So since, be, since the times when it was persecuted and shot, um, poisoned in the environment, external to urban environments, it is now welcomed in cities. And it's, it is seen by many people as being a charismatic species which ha is on webcams. And people love their birds. So now there's suddenly this human race that used to persecute them are welcoming them into the middle of their urban environments. I mean, what can you say? That is fantastic, isn't it? So it that is, is one of the issues that we have in the book that we explore very, very carefully, the population trends in the UK and the world. But we also cover all the subspecies on the planet. So it's 528 pages, Sasha. And it's full color, <laughs> lovely. You're going to love it. And did you, were you saying earlier that the um, the goshawks appearing in a community of peregrines started to change their behaviours? Not as much as you might think. That's a really good question. Um, what it does do is it means they have to be extra defensive when they've got fledglings that have just started to fly. Because as you will know, any bird is, is most vulnerable when it's just fledged. And if a, a young, a fledgling that doesn't really know what it's doing, peregrine, comes out and lands in a conifer tree or, you know, in an area of vulnerability, you may depend that adult gossel will take it just in the same way as it would take opportunistically this osprey, which was, I think, just fledged, was it, or just about to fledge? Same thing. So there's more defensive uh, behaviour of, of the peregrines around the gossel areas. But uh, look, can I just say thank you for inviting me? It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you yeah. today.